Welcome to the Small Giants Fishbowl! This topic is Behind the Scenes, Mastering the Pre-Work to Hire an Exceptional Candidate. In this interactive fishbowl, you will learn about the aspects of recruiting and hiring that Amy Whipple and Carrie Chauche of Purple Squirrel Advisors have identified as crucial to bringing exceptional candidates on board. Okay, here we go. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. And we absolutely would love for this to be interactive to whatever extent, you know, there's questions um, from, from any of you, please chime in, chat with us, whatever the case may be, we, we would welcome that. Um, so we'd love just to first start by introducing ourselves and our involvement with Small Giants. Um, I think as a starting point, we'd love just to say we've been involved with Small Giants for what, about a couple, years. A couple years now. And when we first learned of it, we just felt gosh, this is who we are, this is who we want to be. And um, the idea of being purpose-driven is very much in line with, with us and our values and also with many of the clients that we interact with. So um, Amy, maybe you could mention a little bit more about that. I know Amy went to the summit last year. Yeah, I mean, I just, um, I went to the summit last year and just found it to be such an empowering um, couple of days and um, so informative. I met so many wonderful people and the bouncing of ideas and the focus on culture and for our for us you know it's always our goal to to be a value add to our clients and if we can you know be more educated and know what kind of resources are out there in groups it does it just makes that relationship even um, stronger that we can add value in that way and so knowing about the small giants community and being a part of it is is fantastic for us yeah so now um, we want to let you know that today we plan to dig into some of the behind the scenes uh, best practices for hiring, some key techniques. We hope that you just can take away a couple nuggets, something that might help you and your team as you're looking to attract and retain talent in this very competitive environment. So we're going to talk about process and some things that we've learned along the way. Um, also, we'll share a little bit of the history of, of who we are and uh, what the purple squirrel um, term means. Um, so I'm sure may, some of you may have heard it before, but a purple squirrel is really a recruiting industry term for the elusive perfect candidate. Um, in men, I've been using the term for years. I've been in recruiting for 15 years now. And the way that we had used it in the past was kind of, um, you know, you know, as a recruiter, you work on orders that might be easy to fill first, and then as you get slightly more difficult, once you get to the most difficult, the most niche, the most rural locations, whatever the case might be, that's really the true definition of a purple squirrel. Um, we've come to accept a, a broader definition or a different definition of the term. We believe that every search is really difficult if you're thinking about matching people and culture with the job. So um, we think that if you, you know, looking at the resume, that's one step, but, but taking it a step further and making sure that there's alignment on values and some of those intangibles, that's when you found your purple squirrel. So that's the, the meaning behind our company name. Um, we've been in business for three years and we primarily work with privately held businesses. Um, I would say the majority of our clients are small to mid-size. Um, true middle market companies. So I would say under 500 million in sales would be the vast majority of our clients. And we work on leadership recruiting um, within the finance and accounting space, human resources, operations, and sales and marketing. So um, who we are as a team, as, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I'm uh, one of the founders. Uh, my name is Carrie Chauche. And um, like I said, I have 15 years of experience. Amy is my sister and business partner. And yeah, and I, I have um, different experience. I'm on my fourth chapter of my career, I kind of like to say, and, and it's my most favorite chapter. I started in marketing. Then I was in sales. Um, my third chapter was in nonprofit development and uh, now working with Carrie. So it's been great, though, because my varied background and experience um, complements what we do really well. And, and finally, we have Allie. And Allie is here in the room, but she's not on screen here. Um, Allie's been with our team for about a year. Um, she's um, added tremendous value uh, from the standpoint of just helping us, but also um, contributing um, specifically related to millennial recruitment. And I mean, she's just been a tremendous asset for us. And she's been with us, like I said, for about one year. So, 
So we'd like just to start by um, posing a question to all of you. What are your biggest hiring challenges? You know, we've got a few listed on our, um, on our side, some of the things that we see quite often, you know, aligning leadership teams, you know, even before you go to market on what do we need, uh, writing a job description, um, effective interview practices, finding the right fit or properly onboarding. So if anybody would love, love to chime in, if this resonates, um, any or, or all of these, that would be great. Yeah, we certainly want to focus our conversation on what's going to be most helpful. So feel free to let us know if there's an area that you'd like for us to dig a little deeper into. You're seeing any comments. Am I right, Kamsa? Or? Yes, so it looks okay. like uh, finding the right fit. A couple people okay. saying definitely D. Okay, great. Finding the right fit. Okay, great. Well, first of all, we'd like us to start with some general trends. Um, here in Michigan, we're seeing very, very low unemployment. The October 2017 number was 4.5%. So, um, and there have been over 500,000 new jobs created in Michigan since 2010. So um, for those of you that are here in Michigan or in the Midwest, I'm sure your trends are similar. Um, you know, we've just seen a tremendous, tremendous amount of activity in manufacturing, but also in other industries as well. So we've got a lot of technology companies coming to the area, um, biotech in Ann Arbor. So there's really um, been some phenomenal new companies, new activity coming into our market specifically, which has presented some challenges for, um, for our clients as well, just related to hiring. Um, and we know the national trends, you know, there's nationally, there is some of those same issues, especially related to technical and skilled workers. Um, the uh, millennial recruitment, so uh, attracting and retaining millennial talent with, let's say, three to seven years of experience, especially in functions like accounting and finance, um, is, a, is a huge challenge for many clients. Can you think of any? Um, no, but specifically with Detroit, um, it's been really fun for us in our role to be able to keep talent in Michigan or to bring talent back home. Um, you know, there was kind of a talent drain, um, obviously, during the recession. And, you know, we were educating um, with some of the finest universities talent and then sending them to other states. And so we're really proud of the fact that, you know, we're a part of um, contributing to the, the local economy. And, and we also help um, companies in other areas of the country as well. Yeah, and something interesting um, that we recently saw in the news, so there's, you know, there's the change in headlines has been really fascinating for us here in Michigan. You know, a, a headline from early 2016 talked about the talent drain and the people fleeing our state. And then just a few months ago, there was an article about why I moved to Michigan from Silicon Valley, and you should too. So it's just kind of an interesting, um, you know, change in headlines and kind of what our what our what we have to offer here in in Michigan. So. We'll move on from that. Um, so some of the national hiring trends, first of all, um, this is what we would call a candidate's market. They have more control over the interview process and you know, recruiting in general than they have for several years. Um, social media and mobile have definitely changed the landscape. LinkedIn, I would say, is um, has been a game changer in our industry with um, almost, you know, a, a, a database of so many professionals out there um, for, for public con consumption. Um, there's a huge focus on diversity in, in many searches. Um, succession planning is a really hot topic with baby boomers retiring and in many cases second or third generations don't want to take over the family business. And so those owners are, are looking for other options for succession, whether that be um, private, you know, selling to private equity or strategic buyers. Um, so that plays into the M&A. And then, and then finally, the talent shortage that we were talking about before. It doesn't just touch one function, one industry. It seems to span across many. So first of all, um, we're having something funny. Oh, no, that, that was right. That's okay. So, so the candidate control, um, I'd be curious to know if anybody um, is experiencing this in their companies, but what we're seeing personally and with our clients is that in order to attract top talent, many companies are having to increase their salary ranges, but then this is creating an internal equity issue with their existing employees. Because let's say, for example, they hired employees 
in 2009, 2010, 2011, very different market than it is today. And with the typical three to 5% raise that many uh, candidates are getting, or many employees are getting year to year, um, they're not able to catch up with some of what's happening today where, you know, there is a premium being placed on certain skill sets. And so, um, it, like I said, it's creating an internal equity issue, which our clients then have to address in order to attract the talent they're seeking. Um, and on the topic of internal equity and, you know, talent and attraction, um, it's really important to come out with a strong offer right off the bat because candidates are also getting counter offers. And there's many, many articles and studies about the dangers of accepting a counter offer. Um, but it still happens. In fact, I was just uh, chatting with a colleague yesterday and she shared with me a story of um, a VP of sales that her company was trying to uh, attract. She's consulting with the company and they were trying to attract a VP of sales. He had been you know, grossly underpaid for years, probably at his existing company. Um, they made him a very, very competitive offer. And um, he, his, um, he you know, informed them right away that he received a counter offer. And unfortunately, um, the company that he was with countered to a degree that he decided to stay. Um, and so, I mean, this happens all the time because talent is so difficult to identify. Um, this counter offer problem is one that you have to be aware of. It's something that we discuss with our candidates throughout the interview process. Are you prepared for a counter offer? How will you handle that situation? Um, you know, this is going to be difficult. Um, I'm sure you're leaving for reasons besides money because you really, you know, you don't want it to be all about money when they're coming to join your company either. It needs to be about some of those other intangibles, you know, work-life balance maybe or um, opportunity, um, your mission, growth. I mean, there's so many other things that you want to connect the, the candidate to, not just money. So you want to be digging into those types of issues long before you get to an offer stage. Um, also on that topic on the offer though, also <clears throat> there's also the mental aspect of putting out a you know an, an offer that's going to um, generate excitement uh, the candidates value is going to be recognized and it's just um, we think a best practice for starting that person off on a, on a great foot and a great note in the company um, so that they're really charged up and, and excited well and on this topic on compensation one other thing that's really important to mention I'm sure those of you that hire or are located in New York or California are aware of the new legislation. But there is actually um, recent legislation that makes it illegal to ask a candidate about their past wage history. And you can't demand that of a candidate in an interview process. And so the reason for this is they're trying to level the playing field in those states for um, maybe people that have been disadvantaged, um, you know, there's obviously a wage gap um, discussion that, that, that goes on nationally. And so that is something that those states have chosen to do to try to minimize wage discrepancies um, from, from candidate to candidate. And so it's just something to be aware of and have on your radar if you're hiring in those, in those areas. And then finally, um, the other point we have here is on benefits. Um, you know, it was interesting because like I said, I've been in the, in, in the business for 14 years. I've negotiated many, many offers and, you know, 10, 12 years ago, benefits really never entered into the negotiation phase um, because there was such a commonality of benefits. And now there is such a variance between benefits, you know, from one company to the next that we're finding that benefits are a very, um, relevant part of the negotiation. And so we just recently had an experience where um, a candidate um, was going to be making a lateral compensation move. He knew that because he was coming in at the top of the salary range with our company, but the work was more interesting. And there were a lot of reasons why he wanted to join the company. He was comfortable with the cash compensation package, but then um, when it came time to share benefits information, he had a chance to do it. He did a side-by-side -side comparison and he actually came back to us with an itemized spreadsheet detailing the different costs that he would um, incur with the new benefit plan compared to his existing one. Mm -hmm. And he had asked our client to true up the, the cash compensation in order to recognize the disparity between the two benefit plans. So it's just, I'm sure some of you have dealt with it, uh, but it's something we're dealing with every day. Um, there's also those, um, I would say, um, 
like perks, you know, the work-life balance, health, you know, flexible gym, gym memberships, those types of things obviously are important too, especially when you're talking about um, millennial generation, which they tend to really, uh, you know, value. Um, well, first of all, they value some, you know, mission driven companies. They want to know um, why they're doing what they're doing, not just what to do. And they also, in many cases, not to overgeneralize, but um, also, you know, the, the work-life balance and some of those other benefits are very important as well. So when you, if we want to take a step back and really think about um, how to attract exceptional talent, there's a few things that we think are really, really important. Um, and, and storytelling in business is something that has become a very hot topic. I know we've We've talked about this topic from a number of different angles. It's important for candidates, but it's also very important for companies to, to you know, have a, tell your company story in a way that, um, you know, that's going to convey some passion to the candidate and make it interesting. So, you know, think about the reasons why you're there. How long have you been there? What makes your company special? You know, what makes you get out of bed in the morning? Those are the types of stories that I think you want to include in your interview process. Do you have anything to add? I uh, know. I think okay. Right. Okay. Um, leverage your company culture. Um, you know, so make sure that, um, you know, I know culture is, is, a, is a widely talked about term right now as well, but know who you are and do what you can to leverage the positive aspects of your culture. Um, manage your social media presence. This is a really tough one for some of our clients um, because there is such a, an availability of information and it is a something that you have to manage. So Glassdoor, for example, um, you know, you typically see, or in many cases, it's the, the um, you know, what's the term, the squeaky wheel that, that gets the grease, or, you know, there's- It's the, the negative people. The you negative the people negative that things. are gonna go out to Glassdoor. And so that can be a difficult thing to overcome in an interview process if you've got a lot of negative reviews from those people that have um, had to, you know, be terminated or whatever the case might be. It's a great idea to, you know, encourage your employees. You can't demand it of them. You can't. Um, expect yeah, it, ask but them to ask, you know, you ask them to be transparent and you hope that the employees who are happy will put out a positive review as well. Um, we actually had a, a client that was almost paralyzed um, in the ability to pull the trigger on making a hire because there were such negative comments out on Glassdoor that he was afraid that if we brought great talent to the table, the talent would be scared off if they had looked into you know, what the glass door comments were. So. It was actually one of the first that we met with this client. And one of the first things they mentioned when we walked in the room to meet with them <clears> is they <throat> said, have you been to glass door? Have you looked at our company? And, you know, we hadn't checked out glass door prior to the meeting. We looked at their website and some other places, LinkedIn, but we hadn't looked at glass door. And they basically said, we've got this major, um, reputational issue that we're trying to deal with. And it also made it more difficult for them to um, make internal decisions as well as a result of Glassdoor. Um, the window into the company. So this is a, a term that I think we've coined. I haven't heard anybody else say it, but basically what we believe is that the hiring process is a window into the company. And keep that in mind as you um, are going through a recruiting process that you're giving candidates a lot of cues about um, your company, how you treat people. Do you um, say, do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you provide feedback? Are you timely? Um, do you treat the candidate with respect throughout the process? You know, is, um, is it, you know, a timely process? Is there momentum where that excitement is continuing throughout mm -hmm. or, you know, does it ebb and flow because you can certainly lose um, interested candidates that way? Well, also, um, and, and we'll get into this further more, but also, um, in terms of whether um, different people that they interact with during the interview process are on the same page. These are all many, many cues that you're giving your candidate about your company, your culture, and how you operate. And then finally, just having a great job description. So we touched on this a little bit, but for those of you who are interested in this topic of storytelling, there is a phenomenal TED talk by Simon Sinek, and it's called um, The Golden Circle. And so he talks about, um, you know, we all know what, what we do or how what we do in terms of what are our products, but not very many companies can explain why they do it. So we, all, we usually know what we do. We usually know how we do it, 
But the why is really, really important. And if you can grasp and be able to communicate and articulate that message, basically Simon's point is um, that that is going to um, set you apart. So it's the very reason that your organization exists. And these are the things that make you special. So I would encourage, um, I would encourage you to check this out because it is very um, impactful. And, and on that topic, um, you can incorporate a little bit about your story into the job description. Um, you know, certainly the functions and the responsibilities and, you know, the requirements you want to include in there. But, you know, talk about your culture. Talk about the um, position in, a, in an interesting way um, because that's going to be lend a lot of insight into your culture. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see you know, if somebody has a more, um, you know, certain cultures, they'll describe the company in a way that is, you know, really appealing. And that's going to attract the type of candidate that, you know, will probably fit in really well. Mm -hmm. So again, leveraging your company culture, some things to really focus on and, and have stories around is examples of leadership, um, how you make the work meaningful, um, what philanthropy projects are you involved with as a company? Um, something interesting that's happening in our community is um, a, a movement, really, I would guess I would call it the 100 Who Care Movement. Now we've got a 100 Women Who Care group, but we've, um, our company, along with um, a couple, several others, um, launched a group called 100 Businesses Who Care um, about a year ago. And the idea is to bring together like-minded business people who can make an impact on the community. And uh, in fact, um, something really interesting has started to happen with our 100 Businesses Who Care group. We've got companies involved and they've decided to do internal competitions to decide which organization their company should um, do should pitch at our 100 businesses who care meeting. So the idea is that committed members of 100 businesses who care can bring a nonprofit. Um, if they're a committed member, they can bring a nonprofit and put their name in a hat. And then three people will be randomly selected and there's Shark Tank style pitching um, on these different causes. And then the group will vote and the collective funds um, of all of the committed members will go to that one nonprofit. So some of our members have done really fun internal competitions to rally their employees. And what they're finding is that it, um, it builds excitement. Um, people feel it's inclusive. It's, um, well, and it gives people in all levels of the, at all levels of the company, the opportunity for exposure to leadership, to, you know, hone their presentation skills, research something that they're passionate and care about. Well, and, and you know, I mean, and of course there's many ways that you can do it. I mean, we know the companies that go to do um, a housing project for Habitat and for Humanity. I mean, there's so many ways, but I think finding a way to, to do something as a team um, really helps. Um, um, actually, one more thing on that topic. We, it's really interesting. We have one client um, where their hourly workers, if they're, um, if for whatever reason they don't have enough work for the people to um, have 40 hours worth of work every week, or every, yeah, every week, um, they uh, basically say, we're not going to lay you off. We're going to actually have you go out into the community and spend your time doing community service. So, um, and that's helped that company in terms of retention um, because they're able, they're retaining those employees, they're making a community impact and um, you know, they don't have to go out and hire more people when business picks up or when they, you know, have additional projects. It's really neat. Yeah. Um, diversity inclusion initiatives, professional development opportunities. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? I think yeah, so one quick question on this is, uh, did you have to create a 501c3 and how do you account for donations with regards to this specific example you're giving? Okay, so actually no, we did not have to create a 501c3 because we don't actually collect any money ourselves. Like in, there's, no, there's not a check written to 100 businesses who care. The check is actually written directly to the winning nonprofit. And um, so it, it's really fairly easy to manage 
basically we're facilitators. That's all we are. And the really the group does not belong to us. It belongs to the group, to the group. It's a group, you know, it's, it's just a community of people that yeah. want to make a difference. And so um, for now, the way that we're managing it is that it's everybody just writes the check directly to the, the winning nonprofit and there's no need for a 501c3 or reporting yeah. or anything along those lines. So 100% uh, of the collected donations go directly to the winning organization. And we have um, other members have donated their facilities and refreshments and those types of yeah, things Yeah, we get well. like um, the morning events sponsored with breakfast and, and things like that by local companies. So we've had two meetings. We've had two meetings to date, and um, we've gifted twenty five thousand to one organization and over thirty to the second um, because we have over seventy members now. Um, professional development opportunities. One thing that's really important is that, um, especially for uh, millennial recruitment, is they really want to understand. What, what's the role today, but what, what might my future look like? What are you going to do to invest in me? Um, what type of training opportunities will I have? Who's going to mentor me? Those, two, those things are really, really important to um, the millennial generation. I think those things are all very, very positive. Um, and then finally, team building and quality of life benefits. So we talked a little bit about social media and Glassdoor profiles. Um, you know, employees are the best brand ambassador, brand ambassadors. And it's a great thing if your employees are out on LinkedIn and have a professional uh, profile, if they're active and contributing, you know, to um, topics, you know, topics to that are relevant to your company. Those things are all very, very positive. Um, if you don't yet have a career page on LinkedIn, I would say um, it's extremely important to capture the full essence of your employer brand to be on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn can be a little overwhelming to, um, to use if you're not familiar with it from a recruiting standpoint. So there's a lot of, of information out there in the universe and then it, it, then it becomes more difficult in terms of, okay, well, what do I do with it? How do I use it? And LinkedIn does have resources available to help with training and um, how to use their, their tools. There's actually a tremendous amount of um, resources available at LinkedIn. We talked about the window into the company um, and how you know, this hiring process is going to create lasting impressions. And, and really the goal should be that every candidate that has an interaction with your company throughout the interview process, you should want them to walk away with a positive experience regardless of the outcome. You know, and some of them, of course, might be disappointed, but at least if they can walk away and say, gosh, that was a neat company, they were a professional, they were transparent, they communicated with me, they gave me feedback, all of those things, um, they're going to end up with a positive impression. And that is a that is how your employment brand gets created is not just the people that that work for you, but those that don't and those that interact with your your company through a recruiting process or other um, form within the community. We also think transparency is incredibly important. Um, you know, painting a realistic picture of what it's like to work for your company. Um, you know, give the, the good, the bad, all of it, because the right candidates are going to embrace the challenges ahead and they're going to be better equipped to handle those challenges. Um, we're, we're preparing for another talk that we're giving in a couple weeks here, and we've been talking to some friends who are executives, and we were astonished to learn that um, more than 50% of executive, of people who are promoted into executive level positions fail within the first 18 months on the job. And part of that is a lack of training, but part of it is also a lack of transparency in an interview process. And so it's just something that's so important, not just to get the right fit, but also to make sure that they're going to stay. So one of the fundamentals of recruiting is having an effective job description. It's so funny. We met with a CEO um, a couple weeks ago and um, we had learned of her hiring for a CFO and she was really struggling. And so we, we went to meet with her and we said, well, you know, we would absolutely take your job description and expand upon it. And she's like, I don't have a job description yet. And she's like, I've been dreading it. It is on my to-do list and I just have not done it yet. And, um, I think there's a misconception that 
all CFO jobs are equal. They're all very, very different in some ways. You know, there's not, there's a core set of requirements that you're probably always going to look for in your CFO, but then there's lots of nuance that you have to get into. And so the first part of our slide here is meet with key team members and find out what is it that we need for this position? So, so we'll give you an example. Um, we did a CFO search not too long ago for a third generation privately held business that was growing about 50 million in revenue. Um, they were actually going through um, EOS, mm -hmm. which is the entrepreneurial operating system. So that was pretty interesting to see um, that in action in their company. But when we kicked off the search, we felt it was really important to meet with all the key members of the leadership team. So we met with, um, with the president, with the chief operating officer, with the chief administration, HR, met with everybody, project management, project management sales. sales. And part of what we were trying to understand is what, what are you getting from finance today? What's going really, really well? And, and what would you like more of? What do you need? Where are the bottlenecks? What's, you know, what's your dream of having, what kind of reporting would help you to be more successful? And so we literally spent probably eight hours mm -hmm. with that particular client. We spent on site all day, individual meetings, and everybody was very, very happy to share this information. And so we started with their job description and then we added to it. And everybody ended up with being in alignment. At the end of the day, we were able to say, okay, this is what we heard. Do we all agree? Is this what we want? Is this what we're going to look for? And what we discovered that was that many of the um, needs within the company kind of cross over into operations. So they were absolutely financial responsibilities, <coughs> but there were also many operationally oriented activities. And so that was something that really was enlightening for all of us. Um, so identify the competencies, the competencies, the functions and the goals. One of the things we always ask our client is how are you gonna measure success 12 months from now if in this role? What, what, what has this person accomplished? If you've gotten to the end of 12 months, what are the three or four things? And then put those as key initiatives in the job description. Candidates love it because they're like, wow, okay, like I get it. I love seeing responsibilities and, you know, job requirements, CPA, all those types of things. Those are helpful, but it can help them to formulate a picture of like, you and your needs specifically if you can tell them what some of the three primary goals are well and, and that's actually um our a lot of our candidates have said that our job description was really the basis for understanding their whole onboarding plan and process and you know if the company didn't have a really well-defined onboarding plan it helped them kind of guide that process even a little bit on their own because we had done so much work on the front end yeah um, so again, transparency, it's pretty straightforward there. Um, define success. So, you know, what, like we just talked about, and then finally create a roadmap. So what is our interview process going to look like? Who's going to be involved? What is their role in the interview process? So, you know, in some companies, you'll have one person that'll do a technical interview, one person that's doing a cultural fit interview, one person that's assessing for leadership skills. So think about the different roles that the different interviewers are going to play in the interview process and have that laid out. No, I mean, if you could generally know first interview is going to be with HR and the hiring manager. Second interview, you're going to meet with these three other people. And then for the final interview, here's what we're going to do. So being able to kind of lay that plan out, especially for the candidates after the first interview that you're interested in. Because if they know what to expect, then they're not going to be disappointed if things go slower than they're expecting. Um, then, you know, there's a couple of, um, you know, it's, it, 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 well, I'll tell you one other funny story, actually. On the topic of writing a job description, we met with a client one time and, um, and they had posted a job on Monster and they were looking for a CFO again. And um, we went and met with the, the owner of the company and we brought the job description with us and we were prepared to kind of talk through it. And we got to a section in the job description that, that said, um, this position reports to the board of directors. And we said, okay, great, who's your board of directors? And um, he looked at me kind of sheepishly, he's like, ooh, gosh, we don't have one. Uh, we just found that job description online and we thought it sounded really good. And so, um, you know, that could have created um, some embarrassing moments in the interview process. And so 
you know, I know there is, there's a lot of great job descriptions out there on the internet, but you know, there's, there's some funny things that can happen along the way. If you pick up on a job description, that's not 100% relevant. Um, and then, so I think that's about it for writing an effective job description. Now we are going to move on to interviewing and hiring for fit. Um, I'd be curious to know how many people on the present, you know, that are here in the audience are using behavioral interviews. Does anybody have any questions or is anybody using this with success? We use a, a program called Top Grading okay. um, from uh, Brad Smart and um, it seems to work out really well. It's, it's kind of a nice systematic and process controlled. Um, okay. And then we also do, we also work quite a bit with uh, testing, uh, personality testing and uh, general aptitude testing as well. Okay, great. Do you mind me asking what tools you use? Which testing tools? Yeah. Uh, we're currently using DISC and uh, it's called the GIA assessment. Um, okay. And it's administered by company called Thomas International. So I don't really know if they're, if it's a, it's a proprietary program mm -hmm. for them or whether or not it's yeah. a industry standard. Cool. Yeah, great. No, we we're a big fan of assessments and personality tools. I mean, they can be great for um, the interview process, but they can also be wonderful onboarding tools and tools to facilitate leader discussion. Have you leadership team discussion? Have you used those in that way? I'm assuming as well, or. Well, since everyone's taken them as they come in, so now we can use those amongst ourselves. Yeah. So it, it, they're, they're already 100% uh, within the company, even the existing people before we were doing it, they've all taken yeah. it. So now we all kind of work together on those. Not necessarily the uh, the aptitude assessments, but the, the DISC assessments in sure. particular. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a fan of DISC, and we actually use an assessment called Acumax. Um, which is very similar to PI. PI and Acumax are, are fairly similar, but we use Acumax, and what we found is that it brings a lot of self-awareness even to our own team on communication styles, and um, it's really helped us to work more effectively and to, you know, for me specifically, to be a, a more effective leader, just being aware that the way I like to give and receive information is very different than the way Amy does or Allie, and so, um, by doing those assessments and having that open dialogue, um, it creates, um, you can have fun with it. You know, I mean, we can kind of joke around when, um, when my eyes start glazing over when somebody's giving me too much information. So, because we go, oh, that's Carrie. She likes more bullet points. She doesn't want to hear those 25 things. So, um, so anyway, we, it, they're great for during the interview process and for onboarding. Um, we've got here a set of behavioral interview questions that we put this guide together um, a while back and we've gotten some good feedback on it. So if you think about the most important competencies for the position, um, you, I mean, these are, you would only want to pick probably a few of these in an interview um, because it can be very overwhelming and it, it's, it's actually quite stressful for candidates to respond to um, behavioral interviewing question because they're, you really have to think. And, but you really get to know the candidate on behavioral interviewing questions because they can't, um, you know, they're gonna be surprised and they're gonna have to think on their feet. So you get to, you get to know them very, very well through the behavioral interview questions. Um, but, you know, these are just some examples and we'd be happy to share this um, PDF with anybody who's interested. Um, but, you know, one of my favorites um, is provide an example of a time you went out of your way and jumped through hoops to delight a customer, internal or external. And so it's just you can get a sense of, you know, the communication and kind of how they view customer service, which I think is important at any level um, in any role, and in any role. Um, I love this situation that, you know, describe a situ uh, situation where the initial approach was unsuccessful. What did you do to ultimately ensure a successful result? So you can really understand you know, is, can the person really talk about a failure and how did they turn it around? What did they do? And so um, these are great. Um, another example is we have a client who is struggling to get their team to adopt CRM. And so asking the candidates really specific questions around, you know, have you been part of a CRM implementation? Does your team currently use one? And what do you do with the people who don't want to adopt the tool? How do you handle that? And just really asking those specific questions related to your challenge. 
So we talked a little bit about the um, Acumax assessment, which is something we use, um, you know, and basically what our, the, the assessment that we use tries to identify the, the drivers, the primary drivers for people. And so the there's wiring. the natural wiring. There's not a good or a bad. That's what's really great about many of these profiles and DISC is the same way. Um, there's not a good profile or a bad profile. They, they are just what they are, but there are certain profiles that are better suited for certain types of roles than for others. And so that's a really great way to utilize this. Um, so the A drive as autonomy, you tend to see, um, you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs have a high A drive. The B drive is communication and it's also about relationships. And so um, the B drive people tend to communicate a lot and, and ver very verbal. The C drive is about patience and um, process and the D drive is about certainty. So how much data do these people like to, to go through? So you typically see accountants with high um, C and D drive. And you see entrepreneurs and salespeople higher on the A and B. Those are just a couple of examples. But again, we use it during the interview process, and it's usually not something that we use as, as a way to say yes or no. It usually is just helping us to have more discussion and to understand the candidate better, and then again, to also facilitate um, for onboarding. Um, one other way that you can use some of these profiles, I mean, we use Acumax specifically, but I know there's other tools out there, is you can also profile jobs with the assessment tools. Um, and we've done that. And so you can, um, you can basically do an assessment on what type of person is best suited for the role and you create an ideal profile. And then you can match candidates against it. And again, this is a little bit of science. Um, there's an art to interviewing and selection as well. And I think hand in hand, they can, um, they can work really, really beautifully. Um, we had a situation with a client where we had done a thorough kickoff. We met with all of the decision makers, the board members. We actually spent a full day. We had met in, um, in the central part of the U.S. because board members were coming from all over the country. And um, we were kicking off two searches, a VP of sales and a VP of marketing. And we... Um, Again, we spent eight hours, so we went into 20, pages, 20 of pages of notes. I mean, this was a very thorough discussion, and we got the marketing search was done, and we were um, we had presented the first slate of candidates for the sales position, and we totally struck out, which is very unusual for us. Um, you know, it, and it was just in the first slate. And so we were trying to understand what happened. How did none of these candidates fit the bill? We thought we were matching them against the job description. And so we went through the feedback on everybody and we started picking up on the fact that it seemed that some people were really looking for a change agent and some people were looking for somebody who was going to maintain the status quo. And so no, we weren't, the, the people were not using the same measuring stick. And so that was something we uncovered and we said, gosh, how can we get everybody on the same page? What's, you know, we really had to get creative and we decided to have the team profile the job because we had a suspicion, but we weren't absolutely 100% certain. And so we had everybody profile the job and we did discovered exactly that. There was a huge variance between the profiles created. And so we were able to take that back to the client and we had a really honest discussion with them and they were able to then align themselves internally and figure out, okay, we do need a change. Agent. We do need somebody that's going to have a little bit of that higher A drive and can make some decisions and get uncomfortable if there's pushback because it's going to be for the betterment of the company. And so that's just one example of creative ways that you can use these types of tools. So <clears throat> does somebody have a question? I just saw somebody pop in. Uh, so there's one question um, that's how do you sort of do this stuff when your team is remote or when you have a lot of freelancers? Okay. Do the stuff related to um, like the interview process or what it, okay. So, yeah. How do you involve the well, team? I think Zoom is a great way actually to collaborate on an interview. And so um, actually thanks to the small giants, yeah. we've learned about Zoom. We didn't, we had tried to use um, Skype. Skype for uh, multiple interviews and it was just a complete disaster. Difficult to use um, for whatever reason, we just did not find Skype to be a user friendly tool to have more than one person at a time. And so we learned about Skype um, through, Zoom. through Zoom. I mean, sorry, we learned about Zoom through, 
through small, small giants. giants and we started using it internally about maybe what two months ago yeah. and it has been amazing so um, for that search that we were telling you about we have a board member who's sitting in Arizona and he's really leading the search from the standpoint of our client we sit in Michigan on the in southeast Detroit and um, our candidates many of them are in Grand Rapids and so logistically very difficult. Um, we did not want to all fly in for a first interview. And so we've been using Zoom where we log in, our client logs in, and the candidate logs in. And so we're all three there and we can have a really nice discussion. I think it's a great substitute for an in-person interview. So I would say technology, um, using tools like Zoom, I think you can use for um, collaboration and getting people's feedback. I mean, I think SurveyMonkey could be a good way to make sure you're getting the feedback of people on what we're looking for, how to do it, if it's hard to get you know, time zones or whatever aligned. So I think there's a lot of different tools, but I would encourage technology and video conferencing. Well, and also a, a technology like Zoom, I mean, it saved a lot in airfare costs and, and it just made it a, a more um, fast process. And something that's different about um, our approach is that we actually sit in on the first round of interviews with our client and our candidates. And so when we do have um, a remote type situation like we were just talking about, it could certainly be used as an option. Yep. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So, so onboarding is definitely um, an often, I would say, overlooked part of the recruiting process. And so really, if we think about recruiting, um, it's, there's a circle, you know, this, this, there's really a circle and you've got, it's a continuous circle of recruiting, onboarding, training, retention. You know what I mean? These things all flow together and it's a con continuous circle. And you even need to be thinking about recruiting when you're not recruiting. So what is our company doing? How is our, how is our company being viewed in the marketplace? What are those hot skill sets that we um, that we don't need today, but we're going to need three months from now. And what can we do to cultivate a pipeline? So those are things that are part of the circle. But I would say onboarding is a critical step that is often overlooked. And so um, it's a great idea to do, especially with executive level hires, there's definitely some pre-onboarding types of activities that can happen. Um, one example of a pre-onboarding step is, um, we referenced the CFO search we did for the um, third generation family business. One of the things that made it more challenging is they had a, um, a controller who had raised her hand for the position and had said she was you know, interested in, in interviewing. Um, she was not, in their opinion, qualified, but she also was a valuable asset to the team and they did not want to lose her. She had an incredible amount of knowledge and they wanted her buy-in. And so they selected the candidate um, and then the candidate and the controller met before she started and they had breakfast and they really just wanted to try to start breaking the ice because the controller had the ability to make the CFOs for several weeks of on the job either really challenging or, you know, more positive. And so they wanted to set that person up for success. They, they gave her um, a voice in the interview process. She didn't have the ability to say yes or no but they gave her a voice and I think they made her feel included and that ultimately did lead to an easier transition in. So that's one example. Um, you can also provide um, standard operating procedures and other things that the person's going to you know, need once they start. And of course, if you feel the need to have them sign a non-disclosure or something before they're actually an employee, certainly you can do that. Um, Customize a three to six months onboarding plan. You know, this should include, you know, what are those, some of those specific measurable goals that the person's going to have? Um, you know, some of those softer things like taking them out to lunch, having some company swag on their desk, and just some of those little things that can make a huge um, difference. And then finally, um, if you do use assessments, figuring out how you're going to utilize those assessments during the onboarding process, having that open discussion on communication styles and management styles and, and all of those types of things. Um, like I said, I, there's this, we say 40% here, but we've seen the range is anywhere from 40 to 60% of, of newly promoted executives fail um, within the first 18 months because they're either not properly groomed they don't have the right information. They don't have the right training. Somewhere there's a fail. And so it's just something to keep in mind. 
Finally, we'd love to open it up for any more questions. It looks like we've got about 10 minutes. So I think we're good on time and would love to answer any additional questions that may be out there. Just a reminder, guys, you can submit your questions to the chat feature. You can also just unmute yourself and we can hear from you. I got a question. Sure. Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Um, okay. So, so in finding your your pool of candidates, um, how have you found? Uh, and again, they're all different types. You're all the way from entry level all the way to C suite type of recruiting uh, recruitments. So, where do you have you found the most success in? Um, let's just say more or less a a, a lower level person, an entry level person that you're going to train. Um, versus bringing in a high level executive. Uh, where, where, where are some of the ideas? And just to go put your, your resume out on, on LinkedIn or your job description on LinkedIn or Facebook doesn't seem to be the, the best right. place. So give us some ideas of, sure. of where you find your best recruits. Okay, so I would say LinkedIn is definitely, LinkedIn is definitely a great source for mid to senior level, mid to executive level hires. I would say pr mostly professional hires. I would say LinkedIn is the, one of the best sources. Um, aside from networking and personal referrals and all those other things, I would say LinkedIn would be the best site. Um, in terms of, you know, let's say entry to mid-level, um, I think Indeed can generate some really good results at times. Um, you know, con connecting with your local um, community colleges and universities. Tech, tech, tech programs. Tech programs, yeah. So um, we've got some clients that have done um, really cool partnerships with the local tech schools in providing equipment and that sort of thing in order to kind of create a talent pool. Um, and we have, um, we've heard of another client up in Northern Wisconsin and they um, actually sponsor the, they, their, their, their high school still have like wood shop and some of those other um, more um, hands-on hands programs. programs and they'll sponsor and, and purchase the equipment and have it branded with their name on it. So, I mean, I think there's lots <laughs> of different ways that you can do it, but you know, um, it was really interesting. So we went to hear a talk from the Lieutenant Governor of Michigan recently, and he gave a great talk about the hidden talent pool also. And so there, for certain types of positions, um, there's an overlooked population of potential candidates, and he would include in those people with, um, with disabilities and um, prison to work programs. prison to work programs. And so some of those programs are gaining a lot of momentum here in Michigan. Uh, but I would say um, job boards for low to mid, I would say again, Indeed, Career Builder, and then um, and for Monster. the in Monster, and then for the I don't know as much about Monster. I don't think Monster is doing quite as well, and I think it's really um, geographically specific whether Monster's got a lot of resumes and whatnot. But I would say that LinkedIn definitely. Well, and I think um, we've seen some stats too that Facebook is actually oh, yeah. a, a highly used tool um, in terms of job for job seekers and companies. And I think that that might be a, a great place to capture some of the earlier career talent. Um, additionally, um, there's certain states, and I know Michigan is one of them, has some pretty cool apprentice um, type programs and um, initiatives where schools are partnering with companies <coughs> to provide um, talent where they get like a work study program and then the, the students come out of the program without any um, debt and they have their first job and they've had the training on the on the ground on the shop floor or whatever the case may be while they've been going to school so um, I think definitely looking into your state's uh, programs to see what types of things they might be doing to help fill this talent shortage would be really good and I and we've also heard of some companies that are having success with Twitter um, we have not mastered Twitter, I'll be honest. We, um, haven't. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really made much, many attempts on Twitter, but we've heard other companies do have some success there. But um, Facebook can also be a great way to activate your personal referral network. So there have been a few searches where we've been looking for something pretty specific, and we'll put it out on our personal Facebook pages. Hey, everyone, we are looking for a whatever. If you know somebody, please send them our way. And we actually got some pretty good referrals. And so it's people that we know, but that we didn't know might be seeking 
And, yeah. Or we didn't even know that there's some people that we know, but we never had learned, we never knew enough about what they did to know they might be a candidate for us. And so I think that's something also to kind of open up and consider as well. Um, one other note or one other thought on that is too, is again, your employees are your best brand ambassadors. And if you have an employee um, incentive program, you know, for bringing on referrals and bringing new employees to the table, um, you know, they're certainly going to want to um, put their name on somebody that they trust, respect, and, um, you know, wouldn't mind being connected to. And so, uh, you know, placing a high value on those employees' referrals is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys touch touched on Indeed. Can you talk a little bit more about Indeed? Just how do you see that platform for recruiting? Sure. Yeah. So we have used, um, I mean, Indeed is, is what I would say would be our secondary um, tool. So you can use Indeed. I think in some cases you can post jobs for free. So first of all, it's a very low cost way to kind of dip your toe and see what, what you might find. Um, but you can also sponsor. And so depending on, um, you know, the difficulty of the role or the um, importance, the speed that you want to get it filled, um, you can place a budget on how much per day you'd like to spend for kind of advertising that job to a specific pool. And so, you know, that can be a, a cost effective and kind of good way to manage a, a recruiting budget. Also, there is a database on Indeed. And so you can search the database in addition to trying to identify real active job seekers because I mean there's there's two types of job seekers there's the active and the passive you're mostly going to get active job seekers on a job board unless they're you know they're, and you can maybe find the passive ones that posted their resume several years ago and maybe they've landed somewhere their never resume never came down you might be able to intrigue you know you know get those people interested well and also you can sponsor ads on Facebook too for a relatively low cost mm -hmm. great uh, then you have another question, which is, uh, what are the ethical challenges you have encountered in regards to utilizing assessments? Okay, so um, we ourselves, I don't think, have run into specific ethical dilemmas, but we do know a client who was using a tool that um, it was more, it measured, um, it's different types of aptitudes and, and there's a lot of it was actually a topic in a um, advanced human resources like my, my a good friend of mine is a mass has a master's in human resources and she said that this particular assessment had been a topic of great discussion in her master's classes because it um, was viewed as discriminatory that the discriminatory um, in the way that it evaluated people and so and that there were, um, lawsuits, and, and and that there were lawsuits and so that the tool is wonderlick and I don't know if anybody's using that one but that one is one that I would use with caution um, because it has some discriminatory elements to it um, so we just we use assessments as a data point and we always caution our clients up front like listen we don't want to use this as a go or no go on a candidate it's just something that we want to be um, use in our process so that it, it helps um, facilitate a more productive discussion and you can dig into areas that you know you might want to really focus on in, in a candidate's um, aptitude and their natural wiring yeah so thankfully we haven't encountered that many i would say one other thing to be aware of though um, is just the depth that the assessment is going to go into and what type of personal information it will reveal. We've heard of some that have been quite personal. And I would say though, like we had a candidate actually that shared with us that they were asked to take an assessment that talked about childhood memories and all kinds of kind of overly personal information. And so they didn't feel comfortable with that. Okay. Well, that's it for this one. Check out more fish bowls exclusively for the small giants community at smallgiants.org.